So you, usually when I get introduced, I get introduced as the president of the university that helped start Google and Yahoo and Cisco and Sun Microsystems and Silicon Graphics. But today, I'm the president of the university that trains the best coaches for the 49ers. So uh, uh, Vinod asked me to talk something about the, the innovation ecosystem. And what I want to do is talk about what I think is key to that system and what continues to work well. And then I want to touch a little bit on some of the challenges. And then we'll throw it open for questions. So the, the universities are sort of at the front end of the innovation ecosystem. They're the place where people try things which you wouldn't even guess would be successful technologies and invent those new technologies. The cornerstone of that whole process really begins with people. It really is about people. And the amazing thing about the history of Silicon Valley is you just go down and look at these companies that have spun out of the universities. Hewlett and Packard, both one student, one staff member that started that company. Uh, Sun Microsystems, a group of students, three students, Andy Bechtelshan, Bill Joy from Berkeley, and of course, uh, Vinod. Uh, Silicon Graphics, a bunch of faculty and students. Cisco, two staff members. Um, time and time again, Yahoo, Jerry and Dave, two graduate students. Um, and Google, obviously, Larry and Sergey, two graduate students. So the cornerstone of getting that innovation ecosystem started is really great people. And really what the university serves as is a giant magnet for bringing those people in. We bring them in from around the world. I think the good news is that we're still attracting incredible talent from around the world, both in terms of faculty that serve a mentorship role, that create an umbrella where people can be inventive, and also students. Um, we as a country stumbled a bit after 9-11. Um, we were losing students. In fact, there was a sign up outside Tsinghua in China that said, um, come to the UK for graduate school, visas in 90 days, right? This was a really bad thing for the US. So I got a picture of that. I took it to the Secretary of State and said, this is a really bad thing for us. And we got the whole visa situation resolved. If you look at the numbers, uh, the attractiveness of the US as a destination for great talent is back up. But I'll, I'll come to our long-term challenge uh, in a minute. So the first thing is we get those great people there. The second thing is we give them incredible freedom to pursue interesting new ideas. If there's anything we've learned over time, it's that there's a tremendous amount of serendipity. Of all the companies that I've seen spin out of the university, only perhaps one of them was ever planned from the beginning. And that was Silicon Graphics, because Jim Clark came to Stanford with a vision to recast the way in which graphics was done. But all the others, Sun Microsystems, and the inspiration when Andy started de designing the first Sun were a set of collaborations that came from my colleague, Forrest Basket. We looked at the Xerox Alto and said, you know, I'd like one of those on my desk, but I need one that costs $20,000, not one that costs $100,000. Andy, who I think, by the way, if you've never met Andy Bechtelshan, of all the hardware designers in the world that I've ever met, Andy is Mr. Magic. He can design something that achieves a level of functionality and a level of cost that is truly astonishing. So when a a Andy said, yeah, well, we can, we can do something that costs $20,000 and figure out how to do that. And that was the beginning of what led to the Sun prototype and eventually uh, the company. But it took Vinod's good ideas to turn it into a company. Because in the beginning, Andy didn't know what to do. And he was out licensing it and doing all kinds of other things. But it took, a, it took some good insight how to build that into a great company. Um, perhaps the, the story, there's two other great stories I'll just mention to you, because I think they're indicative of this. Um, when uh, Jerry Yang and Dave Philo were working on the prototype of Yahoo at Stanford, A, their advisor was on sabbatical in Japan. It's a good time to do something different than work on your thesis when your advisor is in Japan. They were working on Yahoo at night. And it became their own pet project. And it was driven simply by the insight that the internet was growing. And they felt they needed a way that they and their friends could record interesting websites so that they could build them. And they started building at night. I remember going over to their office, which was in a trailer. Um, which proves that some of the best work is done not in fancy offices, but in trailers. Uh, and they were sitting in a trailer, and I walked in their office. There's stacks of empty pizza boxes, um, empty Coke cans everywhere, and a sleeping bag on the floor. And they were doing this as a nighttime project. 
And of course, they figured out how to turn it into an interesting company. Uh, Google, the roots of Google were not, had nothing to do with internet search. They were funded to work on digital libraries. Well, a key problem in digital libraries, if you want to build an old digital library, get all the information in books online, is how do you search it? And of course, in books, you have a great thing. You have citations. So if you want to, if you want to look up a book, you want to see, you put Hennessy in there, what book, will, what book will it pick out of that digital library for Hennessy? Well, good insight is pick the book that more people reference than any other book, because that's probably the most important work. That's the key insight. You just take that insight, you apply it to Google, references turn into net link, links in the internet from websites, and you do a fancy computation, which Sergey was the one that uh, figured out how to do that computation fast. You do that computation, and that's back rub the initial Google search algorithm. Okay? Nothing to do with internet search, but of course, an incredible application of that technology could then apply to internet search. So getting those great people in place is key. Ensuring that the rest of the ecosystem works well is also crucial. And I think there we've actually made some progress in the last 20 years or so. We, all the universities, not just Stanford, Stanford, Berkeley, University of Texas, Cornell, University of Illinois, now do a much better job of educating young people about how to be an entrepreneur. We started now 15 years ago with an entrepreneurship program in the engineering school. Business schools do it regularly. I want, if, if I have a young person who's going to go out and start a company, I want them to know something before they walk in to that presentation with a venture capitalist. I want them to so, know something about financing, about a balance sheet, about what kinds of money they need, how they should think about structuring it, what kind of individuals they want on their board, all those kinds of things. We do a better job of that now than we did um, 20 years ago. So that's good news. And I'd say the rest of the infrastructure is overall pretty healthy. Um, we've seen a rise of angels and smaller venture firms filling in the gap with many venture firms now not wanting to look at deals where they're not investing $5 million out of, on day one. But we've seen a rise of angels who are willing to invest time and energy to help a young group really develop their ideas and go the next step. So I think those parts of the infrastructure are in good shape. What are our challenges? I think we have three big problems we, we potentially face. First of all, there is increasingly a global race for talent. And it is just going to get tougher and tougher and tougher. People talk a lot about China. And you look at China's numbers, they're still quite small. But in terms of degrees, research achievements, publications, they're still small. But the rate of growth is 10 times faster than it is in the US. And you just multiply that over time, and you realize that that's going to be a real challenge. We're going to have to fight to get the best people here. I, by the way, I'm in the uh, Tom Friedman class of thought. So the minute a student graduates, I'd staple a green card to their diploma and attach it right there at that moment. Um, and that is one of the things I think that there was when the group of CEOs from the Valley met with President Obama, that was the one thing there was absolute unanimity on, that we should be retaining these people. After all, if you think what it costs, how much money we've invested in somebody who finishes a PhD degree in science and technology in the US, we've invested between a quarter and a half a million dollars in that person. To think that we wouldn't do everything to encourage them to stay here is really short-sighted in its thinking. But that race for talent will get tougher and tougher and we're going to have to stay on top of it. Secondly, I worry about research funding long term. Uh, I think everybody is aware of the crisis we have in the national budget. Um, all the research funding, funding is a tiny sliver in the federal government, a tiny sliver. We spend most of the discretionary money that's in the federal budget on national defense. And everything that goes into universities and research is a tiny sliver over in the corner. But it's easier to cut that sliver than it is to cut national defense or to cut entitlement programs. And the real danger we have is our inability to grapple with the structural budget issues we have in this country could really cost us in the long term. And the, the nightmare story for the US is we stop investing in research and education. We have a less qualified, less innovative workforce. 
that results in a lower level of GDP growth, which results in less taxes, which causes us to further cut the budget. And you go around that loop a few times, and you become a country in Europe where the GDP growth rate is half what it is in the US, and the standard of living begins to flatten out over time. That is a real disaster scenario for the country. The third problem I worry about um, is what is sometimes called the valley of death, um, namely the challenge of getting innovation from its source to, its, to the market successfully. We've been able to overcome that valley of death in the IT sector for a couple key reasons. One is in the information technology sector, you can usually build and demonstrate a prototype in a university research setting that gets the bugs out of the core concept. You can do the experiment, you can make it work, and that is critically important to demonstrating. And if you look at the, what happens with um, information technology companies, most of them do not fail because the technology doesn't work. They fail because customers don't buy it. They fail because they miss a market window or they let somebody else beat them to it. They rarely fail because the technology just doesn't work. But two of the most critical areas in which we need innovation to improve our quality of lives and to improve society are energy and healthcare. And both of those have major challenges getting over this valley of death. Uh, there are different kinds of challenges. In the energy sector, it's simply that the scale you need to get to to change the problem. You've got to take something that perhaps begins with a research project. You've got to figure out how to manufacture it at a reasonable cost. You've got to figure out how to scale it up far, far beyond that prototype. I watched my colleagues um, working on new battery technologies. The difference between building a prototype in the lab with a few cells that works and actually manufacturing tens or hundreds of thousands of batteries that work, that stay within temperature spec, that, that have a sufficiently long lifetime charge and discharge cycles is a completely different problem. Figuring out how we bridge that for battery technologies, for all kinds of new uh, solar cell technologies. Some of you probably saw that the um, company SunPower was recently uh, acquired or a major position was acquired by a French company. Um, that company spun out of Stanford in 1983. That's how long it took that company to go from that to the scale it is today. Long, complex uh, evolutions. Now, partly driven by changes in the energy sector and what happened with the price of energy over time, but it just reminds you of how difficult it is. Um, as hard as it is in energy, it's even harder in healthcare. By the time you finish a research project in the university, you've usually demonstrated, not done no more than demonstrate an effect. To go from that through a set of clinical trials, through a very complex system, to actually get to an end stage where you have a drug that can be demonstrated, can change lives, save lives, is a very difficult problem. As a result, many young potential startups in the biotech sector get acquired quite early on. Uh, they get acquired when they're often little more than a laboratory demonstration, with the result being that they, that product may never see the light of day because it may not be big enough to change the needle inside a large pharma. And this is one of the challenges we face about how we're going to link those together and move those products um, more quickly. In summary, while I think we face some challenges, um, there's a lot of optimism we should have about the whole innovation sector. Um, we are getting great people. We've got a faculty that's more turned on to entrepreneurship, that sees it as a way of making a different kind of impact in the world, different than just publishing papers, but equally important, and in some cases, actually, actually more important. So as we can build that and strengthen that ecosystem, I think um, we'll see a continuing source of innovation uh, coming, out of our, uh, coming out of our research universities. So let me stop there, and maybe we can take some questions.
software innovation. Uh, one key aspect about it is the inherent long long term nature of it and a huge uh, upfront investment and value of that that's going to go through. Do you have a view on how um, U.S. ability to to bet in such a long term versus say China, which appears to have inherently long term perspective, uh, and 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 how would how would you you just deal with that? Yeah. Well, I think you're right that China has an inherent long-term perspective, is willing to see, uh, for example, changes in the energy sector as critical to the long-term evolution of the country, both as a business opportunity and as a solution for their environmental problems, which they will desperately need if they continue to burn the amount of coal they're burning. Um, we've had some success in the current administration with the re-engagement and an understanding that things going on in the energy sector are important parts of national policy. It's not just about economic growth, but it has other important contributions to make. Whether or not we'll be able to maintain that will be the key. If you were to look at the history of uh, funding for energy research in the US, you'd see really stupid moves being made by the government. And I call them stupid because I can't think of a better word for it. If you look at the history, though, how many people remember the oil shock crisis of the late 1970s? Many of you are too young, but a bunch of us remember waiting in lines? You had to wait in lines for an hour for gasoline. Literally, you had to wait in lines an hour long. Right after that, the U.S. put in place a set of new research programs on alternative energy. By 19, then that was like 1979. By 1985, the level had fallen back down to what it was before the oil shock crisis. And from 1985 to 2005, the US investment in energy research grew no faster than inflation over that 20 year period. All the, work, all the research went away because of course if you're not funding it, you're not, you'll get a few people here and there working on little parts of the problem. Um, when we restarted our, started to grow our energy uh, research efforts again, the first money came from industry from a, a consortium of industry companies. And until about two years ago, um, the government that was giving the most money for energy research at Stanford were the Saudis. They were funding more than the US government was funding on energy research. Why were they doing it? They're doing it because they're thinking about making investments for when they eventually have to face the shortage of oil. That's a, complete, a rather long-term perspective, obviously but one which I think is important to have in mind when you think about things as critical as energy. Yeah, it's a good question. You, uh, so the question is, what can we learn from the semiconductor industry, which is also uh, capital intensive, that we could carry over? Um, you know, this is the question that perhaps Pierre should be answering rather than I should. But um, I think some of the things we can learn is that some of the innovations came around pieces of the problem by sectoring it down, right? Lots of the innovation that successfully came out of the universities was around CAD tools a key part of the problem. Some of it around manufacturing technologies and various things that could be done, but often by focusing on a new techni technique, whether it was ion implantation or a new etching technique. So you were able to do it that way. What the universities can't do is pilot an entire line. There is no way. We just can't do it. When I, when I was running the MIPS research project at Stanford, the, uh, uh, the uh, integrated circuits facility at Stanford decided they wanted to try to build a prototype of the chip. It almost killed the entire lab. The level of quality control and precision they needed to match what a company could do uh, almost destroyed them because uh, it was just so hard to maintain. And after they did it, they said, well, that's the last time we're ever going to try to make something that matches what the production levels that get done in industry. So they receded back to making small things. We can make small single devices and I think lots of the most fundamental work now will have to go on in the universities. Thinking about quantum effect devices or organic semiconductors 
And that's where the university belongs, sort of at that far end of the spectrum, um, thinking about new effects. And so we, I think that's probably where the key is. And, and knowing where the university can't make a difference, but we've got to find other ways to invest and build the infrastructure up. We do have, I think, um, we have an example of a very successful collaboration, though, in the Semiconductor Research Corporation. I think there is a successful example of where the industry has matched up with the universities, both to do important research, but also to train a talent base for the semiconductor industry. So there are some good examples of consortia being able to make that kind of contribution. John, I have a question uh, about Stanford. Um, I just finished a negotiation with Stanford recently, a uh, license in technology. Uh, why does Stanford care about a royalty with, when something's being spun out? Why not just get an equity stake, do what Vinod does, and just focus on creating the next Google, the next Yahoo, and forget about the, you know, the nickel and diming on royalties? Yeah. Well, sometimes they ask for a royalty because they have a short-term perspective of what they have to do in order to um, maintain a revenue flow. Obviously, equity is a, um, tends to be a bimodal distribution in terms of its value. Uh, so sometimes the team will focus on, on royalty rather than equity. But of course, there's always a price for which they'll take more equity and zero royalties. It's just a question of finding that, uh, that appropriate mix. Um, what our philosophy, about, our philosophy about the technology licensing office is to um, get a fair return for the university, but to ensure the technology always gets transferred. Because if what happens is that we become the blockage to the technology getting transferred, then we failed completely, right? Then, we, then we're not doing our job, and I think that's what we don't want to, that's what we don't want to become. And we, um, we do try to take a bigger picture. In fact, I'm often asked to give advice to university presidents about their technology licensing office. And so I start, I tell them a story. I said, think of the largest royalty you could have ever charged Hewlett and Packard for their little invention that they did at Stanford. Do people know what they invented? They invented a temperature compensated resistor that actually worked by, in its prototype by using a light bulb filament to build a temperature compensated resistor, which allowed them then to build the world's most accurate audio oscillators, which then got used to make Fantasia. Uh, and that was the first product from the company, the seven audio oscillators that were sold at Disney. Um, but I say, think of the most you could have charged them in royalties. And now, multiply by 100,000 times, and that's roughly the amount in personal philanthropy that the families and Hewlett and Packard gave. So one has to keep that bigger picture in mind over time um, while still trying to think about doing something uh, that's fair and reasonable for all the parties. They're coming with a microphone. Uh, Jeff Brown, Nordic Wind Power. How do you um, determine the technologies of all the different ideas that, that come to you that the university will work on? Is it, is it simply what the professors can go get funding for, or is it more sophisticated than that? Do yeah. they eat what they kill? Yeah. I mean, well, when Eric, when Eric mentioned before the chaotic way in which universities um, uh, operate themselves and manage themselves, right, there are 1,500 bosses at Stanford University and none of them have the title president, provost, or dean. They have the title professor, associate professor, or assistant professor. And they really are running the show. And that kind of freedom for them to pick where they think the biggest opportunity is, is absolutely crucial. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't look sometimes for new areas where we think there are distinctive opportunities. Because there have been technology shifts. We see a global problem. We see um, a strategic issue for the country or the world. Or perhaps we even see individuals who might be willing to help jumpstart a field. So we will do that. And we, we raised over a period of about six months $100 million to build up the Precourt Institute for Energy Research because we believed that energy was going to be a crucial long-term problem. And if I sat, I could sit there and wait for the federal government to start pouring research in. But the problem with that is you have to start recruiting graduate students and you have to start recruiting faculty. Universities have a very slow slope to get up to speed on a new research area. The individual faculty can move, but 
really to build a team, you need a half a dozen graduate students, you need a few faculty members. So we have a slow ramp to get there. Once we get going, we're pretty good at keeping the momentum up. Um, so we raised that $100 million, really, so we could make an investment, recruit faculty, recruit graduate students, and then get started with the whole process. And that was our, that was our goal in doing that. So we pick out strategic areas like that. Um, the bioengineering, the intersect, intersection between the engineering disciplines and the biological sciences, biomedical sciences, where we saw real opportunities for taking discoveries in the biosciences and turning them into clinical applications. Um, I think that's an area where we saw a, a great opportunity as well. So when we see that, we'll try to, the president, the provost, the deans, will try to position some resources and encourage people to move there. You can't tell faculty what to do. It's like herding cats. Um, and by the way, if you ever want to see how hard it is to herd cats, there's a great video. Go online to YouTube. Look up herding cats. You'll have the best laugh you've ever had in a long time. Um, but it is like herding cats. And what I tell people is the president has a little cat food in his pocket, and he can put it out in interesting places. And if the cat food is high enough quality, then the cats may decide to go over there and do something interesting in that field. Thank you, John. Thank you, Vanu. <laughs>